So yeah, so I know we went over the kind of the, the bat, everyone's background in this and where you are. So what I'm going to do is for the beginning part of this, originally uh, there was supposed to be a completely separate class on how to get out of a massive collection. Someone's <laughs> going to give it. They, they unfortunately had to bow out. Uh, this was going to be the opposite. However, I added the, uh, the getting out part. I will emphasize that piece. But what I'd like to do just for sake of completeness and to make sure we capture everyone's thoughts, we'll start from the beginning. We just we won't take a lot of time to go through it though. My name is Dina Tarnacola. Um, I'm a systems architect from a, a, at a, for a pharmaceutical company. I've been in the hobby for how old are you now? <laughs> yeah, 41 years. I'm 52, so I got my first computer when I was a teenager, uh, 77. I got a TRS-80 Model One. Fell in love. Oh yeah, man. yeah, big Z80 fan ever since. Z80 fan. Z80 for the win. Z80. So, um, yeah, so we'll, 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 I can definitely speak to some of these issues. All right, so, again, I know you've already been through this, but there's things, people ask me, how do I start a collector? I'll ask them, before you start, think about what kind of collector you want to be. Why do you want to be? For fun and nostalgia, eh, what happens is, if you do that, before you invest a lot of time and money, really think about it, maybe play with emulators. Because if you start with this, chances Chances are your curiosity is going to be satisfied, you're going to get bored, and you're going to regret spending a lot of money. You want to showcase them, you want to get them, put them in a nice case because you like them and you want to show them off. Eh, good reason, but there's considerations with that as well space considerations and time considerations for all of these things. Some people want to start collecting to resell. Eh, okay, I mean, it's, a, it's a one risky proposition, too. Uh, depending on how you approach it, you can lose friends. <laughs> and right? dollars. And, and dollars, yeah. <laughs> Lots of dollars. Lots of dollars. It, it, yeah. Or you can collect for academic curiosity. Um, to me, that's a great reason. You want to preserve, um, catalog, record, share your knowledge, learn. The, to me, that's the most interesting enduring reason for collecting. But, Everyone's in there. Or, this is the worst one, collecting to collect. Beware. <laughs> hoarding. Yeah. Hoarding. Beware the evil of hoarding, okay? It's a bad thing. It doesn't, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you use evil with the same thing? I knew I'd do this class for a reason. Never ended. Well. Yeah. Well, it's a bad thing. Never ends well. So that brings to, if you're going to start collecting, what type of collecting do you want to do? Some people like collecting by period, uh, decades, um, certain time ranges, vendor specific. I love Tandy, any Radio Shack type of computers, but I collect all types. My, my, my curiosity is mostly academic. Type of technology. So some people will collect for certain CPU architectures or bus types, S100 machines, for example. Uh, computer types. My son, huge fan of any kind of portable computer. He has all kinds of handhelds and calculators. Go back to the analog area, like slide rules and add machines even. Right? So anything you can kind of move around and not need to leave plugged in. Some people also love to collect peripherals along with the computers. Uh, that, again, I would use caution. <laughs> they tend to multiply. <laughs> uh, some of them aren't very useful. You know, the dot matrix printers especially. I mean, they're easy to get, they're cheap, and they're kind of cool. I love hearing that sound. But, again, how often do you use them? You know, you have to find the ribbons, really. I'm a big, right now, I'm a big fan of uh, thermal printers for that very reason. Thermal paper is easy to get, it's cheap. It works really well, and there's no nothing to really maintain. Um, some people collect by form factor. Love those portables, clamshells, desktops, minis, micros, you name it. Okay, and now this is one part a lot of people ask: getting help. Why <laughs> well, do you guys know this already? Yeah. The internet's your friend, right? News groups, forums, websites, mailing lists, VC edit. Vintage Computer Federation happens to have a really good mailing list and a, and a really good forum. 
magazine and book archives. A lot of these are available online. Uh, I don't know if there's any magazines that aren't available online in the old days. Magazines and book archives are great because one, they kind of get you into the mindset of the period, uh, and you, you do find some obscure knowledge in those articles that people have long forgotten. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of going through those. Plus program those things that you can type into your, your new vintage computer and have fun with it. Yeah. Oh, everyone's, everyone remembers having fun with those and fighting the other program working only to realize a month later when you hit the next issue, oh, there was a bunch of typos in the list. <laughs> oh. Oh, good. good times, good times. Uh, clubs, if there's clubs. Not many computer clubs around these days, but, you know, again, ECF, we have monthly workshops, uh, great place to learn to get your stuff right here. Museums, yeah, not to keep plugging ECF, but right here. Your best resource, knowledgeable friends. <coughs> that uh, if you're lucky enough to have somebody who's uh, really good at electronics or has a lot of knowledge about things that you're computing, keep them as friends, make them happy. All right, so again, you're gonna start collecting, you're already collecting. You want something to consider. What are you willing to do? Right? You're going to be doing repairs, especially if you don't have a ton of money to buy machines that are pristine and guaranteed working, which even if you have the money, sometimes it's very hard to do. Uh, at a minimum, if you're going to take on repairs, you're going to look at a basic knowledge of electricity and electronics. Because once you don't fry yourself and you don't fry your equipment, uh, basic soldering, you might want to have spare components on hand. So to kind of uh, sneak into the whole hoarding theme, you might have three or four of a single machine. Spare parts, spare parts, remember that, right? Why do you have so many of these? Spare parts. Three collections, not once have I touched a soldering iron, but I do have good friends that use <laughs> yeah, see? Yeah. That's called outsourcing. Absolutely. <laughs> there, 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 there's proof right there. Mm -hmm. Don't think you have to have this. Because a lot of it has to do with how what kind of path you choose. Especially sure. the older stuff, though. If you're really into older stuff and fixing things yourself, if you're getting a 1970s computer, in early 80s, you're going to probably, especially, sorry, yeah. Commodore. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, it's just, it is. Uh, yeah, there's, there's certain machines that. Uh, they're just going to need maintenance after 40, 35, 40 years. It's just not going to work well anymore. And it's just a fact. And, and, and um, Adam is absolutely correct. You don't have to do this. It's just a suggestion if you want to really dive in with both feet. Um, you know, some of the stuff's not very expensive. Kind of cool to have. Digital multimeter, uh, they can be, I'm sorry, yes. I was just going to pray, though. It also helps you understand your equipment a lot better. It, it really does. Yeah. yeah. If you know how to replace the capacitors, you're going to learn. Very quickly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You, when you dabble into starting to repair your own stuff, you learn a lot about it. You're going to start diving in, into schematics and really, really getting into the meat of things. Um, an ESR meter, they're not very expensive. Uh, you will be replacing capacitors on certain older equipment. It's a magical thing to do because a lot of times capacitors, they, they do dry up, they do go bad, they do flow, and you replace them. and Everything it's magically easy. starts working again. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. Um, so you also got to get good at solder. Uh, schematics very important. Again, lots of schematics available online. There's very few times when we have trouble finding them, even for some obscure equipment. Someone's got them somewhere. Uh, now advanced, I don't recommend anyone go out and buy these unless you're already an electronics technician. A, a oscilloscope and a logic probe, I mean, that's really for guys who are really into it. Someone like Ian, right? they, they, somebody who can make good use of this stuff, the, where the investment pays itself back. I've never personally had a need for an oscilloscope um, or, a, or a logic probe. I'm not repairing things down to that level. I wouldn't even know how. Um, you know, even, even adjusting the speed on a, on a floppy drive, you don't need a scope. A lot of times there's a pattern printed on a spindle motor, point a fluorescent light at it, 60 hertz. You know, it'll flash and see when it's the right speed. It, it's, it's not necessary for a lot of things. But you do want to think about how much space you have. Um, do you want your stuff to be viewable? Or do you want it to be usable, not necessarily viewable, so it doesn't have to be deep? Or both? I kind of like to be both, personally. 
Um, the screenshot corners is kind of a sample of my space. It's kind of a combination of viewable and usable, only because right now I'm pretty much out of space. So I have to, I have to do what I can. Um, but it hasn't stopped me from acquiring it. <laughs> 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 we'll start talking about the dangers. Safely. If you want to start a collection, find somebody already in the hobby who has no space left. That's, yeah, that's, that's the good way to do it. That's the secret. It's a good, a good way to do it. Yeah. I, I, and he's probably, I'm sorry? And he's married. And he's married. <laughs> even, even better reason. Yeah, I probably have three or four spares of things you probably want. <laughs> and storage for things that you aren't going to touch or look at for a while, right? Ideally, some place that's cool, relatively. Relatively dry. Uh, I can't tell you how many times we've had someone pull a barn find or an attic find into the workshop, and there's been a rat's nest, a mouse nest. Um, they, they they tend to defecate, and urinate inside the machines, which will quickly destroy PCB. Um, also, bugs. hantavirus. What's that? Also, it can give you hantavirus. Now, fortunately, the computer is not susceptible to it, but, but, yeah. <laughs> but the technicians are. Yeah, machines like that. I mean, seriously, I, I put on a breathing mask and wear gloves when they're like that because it's to clean them out. Yeah, you mess around with it. And then, if you're gonna again, if you're gonna store for long term, I recommend having it in a box, putting a drop cloth over it, so the debris doesn't get in. Just makes your life easier later on. Okay, you might want to do restorations. If you, you know, if you don't like the machine being dirty, scratched, dusty, whatever it is, besides giving it a cleaning, sometimes it's really nice to restore these things. However, if you're into authenticity, you want to be careful before you start <coughs> taking certain chemicals or certain things to your vintage equipment. Uh, some people will tout a magic eraser to get dark stains out. Mm, not so good. A magic eraser is basically, basically puffed melamine, and it's very abrasive. It'll be the same out, but it's going to, re going to remove the finish from your equipment. It's going to remove plastic. You're going to notice it afterwards. So what would you rather have? Stain or to have the, your equipment looking like it did when it was new, minus the stain? I mean, for me, I don't care about a few dark patches or stains or, or fading. It doesn't, doesn't bother me that much. I, I'm more concerned about it working. So again, just, just uh, tread carefully there. If you're not a stickler for 100% authenticity, there's a lot of cool things you can do. You can get new 3D printed parts or molded parts, cases, uh, important latches, covers, things like that. Um, we can talk about mods, modifications. Personally, not a big fan of most modifications, especially when they alter the appearance of the, of the, of the item. Um, some people just insist that they want to get better video quality out of the equipment. They do a composite modification or an RGB modification or a VGA. My view is when the equipment was designed, it was designed for the display that was most common at the time. If it had RF out, it meant it was meant for people's TVs. And the soft, most of the time the software was designed with that in mind. If it had deposit out, great, you, you, you can use that. Even, you, can, you know, you go to Walgreens right now and buy a cheap little LCD that probably has composite input on it. I, I, I'm just not... It may or may not work with some of the vintage computers. May, may or may not, yeah, you have to... You have to <laughs> yeah, that's getting, becoming a real issue. It is becoming an issue. Brand new ones are becoming less tolerant of older video signals. Your best bet, and this is what I do, I go to garage sales and I get LCDs that people have thrown out. 10 years old, you know, maybe seven years old, five years old. Those things are great. They accept almost any kind of video input and a wide range of frequencies. Um, and they also accept uh, PAL or, or NTSC. I bought Amiga 1200 from somebody for a couple hundred dollars. Oh, well, I'm selling it cheap because it's PAL and nobody wants it. Plug it in there, came up on my display. There's a function key it hits, which is over to NTSC. Thank you very much. I just saved you know four or five hundred bucks. Um, anyway, modern uh, replacement peripherals, right? There's especially storage replacements, disk drives. It's a bear to get old disk drives working, and you have to really maintain them and watch them. Uh, it's not a lot of fun to open them up and clean them and check the, uh, the speed and the head skew and all that good stuff. 
Uh, that's the kind of thing if you're going to do low level repairs where an oscilloscope actually comes in handy. Again, I don't know about, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but I, I'm just, I don't have that kind of time. So, um, SCSI to SD is a, is a card you can put into uh, several machines, or not a card, but, you know, it's a card, but it looks into the SCSI bus on the machine, and instead of connecting to a hard drive, you can store everything on an SD card. Fantastic. It works on Macs, it works on Amigas, um, pretty much anything with SCSI. It's pretty much anything with SCSI. Atari SD is a little bit different because the some of the versions don't have true SCSI, they have what they call Atari SCSI, mm -hmm. so you need an adapter. But he was in the next yeah. the next to the museum we has one. <laughs> Doesn't the Lisa oh, yeah. have? So I know Lisa. One of the Lisa's has one. Yeah, at least the Lisa in the museum. So this is this is very common. And you wouldn't know the difference, right? Except that it's faster. Right? Well, it's Scuzzy to SD even does some really weird esoteric Scuzzy things like IBM's strange block size counts and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be more compatible than general real Scuzzy drives too. Right. Yeah, that's the other thing. He's absolutely right. Scuzzy drives, especially back in the day tended to be specific for certain systems. If you had a Lisa or a Mac, it wanted certain SCSI drives. Couldn't just go buy something that said SCSI on it. Wouldn't always work. These, these are very common of different formats. Uh, floppy drive replacements, GoTech. Uh, it's a great cheap floppy drive replacement. It's, you can get it for as low as $20. <laughs> you can go online. There is a um, firmware that you can use the flash. It's called Flash Floppy. And it's free, and it lets the GoTech emulate a lot of different floppy formats. Uh, the only thing it won't do is machines that uh, don't do FM or MFM. Um, it, it's just a completely different format, and, and it doesn't work for those. Like the Atari underline, uh, what was it, what were the other ones that did that? Uh, Apple? Well, Apple, Apple. A, older Apple with the GCR, it's not an MFM floppy format. So, right, so yeah. they won't, they won't, GoTech's won't work in there. Um, but there's other solutions for the Apple. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I was going to say, there's a guy, I can't remember his name, he's represented Big Vessel Wires. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Who, who has built a freaking phenomenal disk emulator system for Apple devices. That particular one, I can't, the name is easier now, but I, remember, I, I have one. one. They work great. They were not being used. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 They're, they're fantastic. The first version of it was Mac only. He built another one that works on the Apple II bus now. Yeah, correct, yeah. The yeah, current one actually, well, the, the, there was one that where you had to configure it to be either. Mm -hmm. um, the newest one, I understand, is compatible right out of the box with either. Yeah, the thing is Mac. Correct, yeah. The old one, you could actually blow it if you try to connect it without doing the right. yeah. switch first. The new one, you won't, you won't hurt it. Um, no, yeah, those are fantastic. As a matter of fact, I mean, I have plenty of Apple floppy drives that work. I don't use them. No, don't I don't want them. to wear them out. I don't want them to go out of line it for when I really need them. So I use the, the, the flash floppies. Um, you know, tan, uh, for the old handy computers, uh, Ian Maverick from Australia sells a great um, uh, floppy emulator and hard drive emulator. It's amazing. Um, XTIB, if you're a collector of old IBM PCs, fantastic. They go into an ISA slot. And um, put an SD card in them, or uh, it actually has a um, an ID connector. So you can connect any kind of ID drive or a compact flash, you know, drive that emulates ID. So you're saying you can either you can put it in the XC and you can get it like a modern ID drive, like plain old PA. Yeah, as long as it's a pad, yeah, pad drive. You can attach a pad drive to it and it works. I think John was even yeah. selling Split was selling a version uh, of that. Might still be with some oh. improvements. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're really good. Do you, do you need a separate uh, command for the, I think the SD card is compact flash solution? Do you need a separate adapter or? No, anything that will plug into the pad port will work. Yeah, for compact flash, you can make it. So actually, you have the XCID, you get to the ID interface, and you get the uh, basic ID to, to, to the compact, compact flash adapter. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, compact flash is great because it, it actually has a subset of the ID uh, interface. Yeah. So it, it's a direct replacement for our address. Nice. Very, very cool. Um, yeah, those are great, especially if you have a 5150, which was never designed for a hard drive. This will actually let you put a hard drive in an original IBM PC. Uh, wi Fi modems. Again, these things are fantastic, right? Now, they're not genuine, they're not, I mean, they're not vintage, but who cares? It, it emulates a modem so your computer can connect to the internet or bulletin boards and it thinks it's talking to a modem over a serial port. Can't, can't say enough good about this. And if you have computers that take cartridges, uh, especially if you're going to demo computers or have fun with them, 
multi-cards. The multi-card is generally just a cartridge that you can stick an SD card in and you can load it up with software. They exist for pretty much every platform that exists. Atari, Honor, you know, you name it. TI, anything takes a card. All right. Now we get to the acquisition phase. Once you decide what type of collector you want to be, what you want to collect, hopefully you've done that. Now, the first thing I, su I suggest to people, look at the stuff you already have or might have that you don't know about. Look in the attic, look in the garage. I found an Atari 7800 that I thought was gone for 20 years, right? So, and it was in perfect shape, and it was great. And a Game Boy, too, thought it was gone. Um, so methods of acquisition, right? And I'm sure a lot of you guys know this already, but real quickly, great way, you know, tell your friends, any associates, hey, I'm with the industry community, you got anything old? You wouldn't believe how much stuff you get. It's happened, last year, it happened four different times I showed up to work, there's a box on my desk. What the hell's in here? Old computer program. <laughs> Aren't you the guy that makes old computers? <laughs> great, thank you. Right. I mentioned it on a group chat at work, and somebody sent me a piece of one. Yeah, there you go. Right. I'm like, it's like I got this sitting right. You want it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah, absolutely. Can't say again. Can't say enough good about that. Forums, mailing lists, news groups. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's another time. Um, I think I was in some crazy situation like that. I bought a couple of Captain Dick Thunder things. He mm -hmm. had this whole. It was like a whole pack I had to buy, which is fine. But all of our eight bit stuff, a uh, hundred SPs, like three or four, just pile it all in. Nice. Like, Hundred bucks for everything. Oh, what? <laughs> yeah, buying lots yeah, is you can learn out. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, you, and when they're that cheap, working or not, you have a bunch of spare parts, right? Yeah, space. Yeah, space. Which I don't, but yeah. Yeah, man. So you so have a bunch you of have, you have friends, though. No, we have friends. Thankfully, for now. Jason, well, that I have to get over to Washington somehow. I think you owe me some two C's too. <laughs> I do. I have two C's. Right? Um. Uh, my favorite, garage sales, yard sales, and estate sales. You can get stuff next to nothing, most of the time. Once in a while, we go to an estate sale, and the, the company running it knows what they have there. A lot of the times, though, they won't leave them in the house. They'll take them, and they'll put them in different, they'll put them in a for auction. But sometimes they leave them there. I picked up an Apple, an Apple IIe with a black and white monitor and two disk drives for $40 at an estate sale. And yeah, it's fantastic. Um, flea markets, they're not, we don't see a lot of them anymore, but there's still the MIT flea up in Massachusetts. Uh, it's a fun time. Hamfests, Jeff mentioned it before uh, in one of the other sessions. Hamfests are fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of vintage equipment there. You know, not all of it's computer stuff, but it's always fun to look around. Uh, there's a big one coming up in Sussex County in, is it June or July? <clears throat> You enjoy it, but look, look it up. Sussex Hamfest. Storage live for sales auctions. Going back to what you said about having to get lots. Usually these are where you have to buy the entire lot. Again, may, depending on what's in there, it may work out for you. Um, thrift shops used to be great. Salvation Army's caught on to the vintage thing. So they now pull that yeah. stuff out to stores yeah. and put them up on their, with their auction site. Yeah. So the prices now are crap. But every once in a while you find something in one of them because whoever was sorting the stuff didn't follow the rules. So it might get lucky. Antique shops seems unlikely, but once in a while you get lucky. They might have, like I knew a guy had an antique shop near me. He had um, some old radios, some yeah, old uh, short radios. radios. I'm sorry? Tube radios. A tube yeah. radios, right? Things like that. Maybe you're into other kinds of old, you know, vintage technology, which you know, my family is, you know, my son's got a Victrola and a tube radio, and he loves this stuff. Um, recycling centers, right? Great. In my town, they have a trailer. Every Saturday, people come, they can dump um, electronics in this trailer. I'm lucky because in my town, you can just go in there and take and leave with whatever you want. A lot of places aren't so nice. They either have a contract with the recycler where they, they own everything that goes in there so nothing comes out. Or they don't let you in there for liability reasons, right? And, which is a lot of the time, unfortunately. Again, I'm lucky. I, I make sure I stay friends with the guy who runs the place. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain he's working off a uh, public serve, uh, you know, a public service uh, sentence. But yes. hey, whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, Anything to the hobby doesn't bother me. Any uh, 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 reasons to be nice. Uh, um, <laughs> 
uh, retail recycling centers, they, you know, computer recyclers, right? Because you know, those, they, 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 they make me sad because people go in boxes of stuff, they leave there, they pull out the valuable stuff, mark it way up, and just resell it. They don't test it, they don't clean it up, they don't do anything. Don't like it. Uh, so it's just as a matter of principle. Dumpster diving and curb watching. Again, it's, it's, it could be valuable, but you got to be careful. In certain towns, you're not allowed to touch stuff that's on the curb. It's, it's only for the garbage company. I get it because they don't want people sorting for people's garbage and leaving stuff all over the place. Um, so before you do stuff like that, before you pick a TV up off the curb, know your local ordinances. Make sure that the bugs can get to it before you. <laughs> the bugs? Dogs. Dogs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got an Eagle PC2 wow. on the curb in pristine condition. Nice. That's and this is this model of Eagle was only manufactured about a couple of years. This is just before the owner committed suicide by driving his car off. Okay. Uh, because he got caught, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know whether he did it intentionally or otherwise, but I even caught him in, on the BIOS code and figured he pinched it. Oh, so boy. They're, they're, they're going to take him to court. So I'm glad you mentioned that because in a little while we're going to talk about the providence of these pieces. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there you go. But I'll notice, I mean, I noticed there's one big thing missing, which may be intentional. Uh, what about eBay? Mm. <laughs> eBay is the other thing. Just ah, <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Just like I said, I, just like we planned. No <laughs> rehearsal, guys. No, just like we did this. Um, this I put this, excuse me, kind of in last, even though it's it's the best and the worst way to get stuff. It's the best because it's easy. Everything's right there. It's like a mall for vintage stuff at your fingertips. It's the worst because the prices can be bad. However, bargains can be had if you know what you're looking for and you time things right. I know a lot of these guys do like lots too. Like you get around the way for the lots and you right, you get the right timing. I haven't done any EV for a while, but yeah. when I did, I, I would I wait for the big stuff because you get a better price. Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah definitely. My my favorite thing is when something just comes up while while, while you're looking and it's got to buy it now mm -hmm. and the price is ridiculously low. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't happen often, but once in a while you get lucky. Yeah. My favorite yeah. trick is when uh, they make a Macintosh and label it an Apple computer or vice versa. That's and it's awesome. like, why does this thing? Oh, it's the uh, it's the it's the Macintosh two C. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Another tactic to think about, and this one almost worked for me. Uh, you see the stuff on eBay that looks really crazy. Um, mail it. Since mail the, the lister. So I saw two a guy who had two inside in the 80s mm -hmm. stacked up there. They, they were in rough shape, but one was absolutely stuffed with cards. Wow. And you have the present like $1,800 to repair them. It's not unreasonable. I uh, wrote him and he's like, I'll let, I'll let you have those stuffed ones for 600 bucks a month. And wow, nice. I didn't, I didn't take it. But, um, but yeah, but, but that's the thing. I mean, yeah. that never hurts to ask. Yeah. Never hurts to ask. The only time something you'll get insulted is if they're really, uh, you know, they're really thinking that they're going to get a lot of money for something, and you make them an offer, which you know, again, I don't like. It. On Facebook, there's a lot of for sale pages. People say, "Make me an offer." It, it, it's horrible because a lot of times people get offended. You know, you make what you think is a fair offer, and they get mad. Well, then don't don't say make an say offer. Make an offer. Right. Yeah. Um, so some of the pitfalls, right? Buying stuff sight unseen. Somebody can say everything's working and you do get some protection from any day, but it's not always clear cut. There's things you can look for, right? You really take a close look at the photos. If you have any doubt, eat, like you said, email the person doing the listing. A lot of times they'll clear up your questions. Um, and uh, look out for certain keywords. Unable to test. I mean, really, you couldn't just plug it in, right? <laughs> Something that takes batteries, untested. Right, untested. <laughs> now, to be fair, there are some times where people said that, and I took a chance, and they worked fine. Oh, yeah. so, but, but that's when you really have to factor your price in. Right. Yeah. If somebody's right. saying unable to test, and it's, a five, it's five dollars, and you normally see it, you know, working perfect for two hundred dollars, you might want to roll your dice. But right. if it's if it's the going price for the equipment, and they say they haven't tested it. That says they have enough knowledge about it to know the price, but not enough knowledge to see if the thing plugs in and turns on. There's something, there's a disconnect there. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. really think long and hard about it. And also always remember CRTs don't ship well. Nope. They, they, <laughs> they just don't. And for a lot of reasons. We, we, everybody here knows how to ship a CRT. No one in eBay knows how to ship a CRT. No, they, they, they really don't. And I'm actually going to go into that later when we go to the, the ending part and shipping. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to say about eBay is uh, I'm a big fan of the snipe. There's a big philosophical argument. I'm just going to state this, I'm going to let it go. If everybody waited till the absolute last second, psychologically, you're really putting in what you think the limit is, and you don't get into these bidding games and start bidding emotionally, right? And usually it's going to end up happening, you're going to get it from a more fair price. You get into these bidding wars that start 20 minutes before the thing ends, price goes way, way up, and it hurts the hobby because stuff goes way up over what it should be, and it excludes people. But now, do you snipe personally as a person, or do you use software? Uh, no, I do it personally. As software, I don't, I don't see that it ever helped. Also, I put a bid in, I word. counts down to three seconds, bang, gets in, I either win it or I don't. And then I don't feel bad because I really did put in what I, I think it's worth. If I lose it, then I think that person paid too much, and I move on. I might be sure I'm disappointed, but I move on. Um, and all the normal warnings about, you know, Craigslist and buying from people that you don't know. <laughs> Everyone knows. I got a question. You yes. have let go there, which is kind of the new kid on the block. What yeah. Do you, what do you think of them? And the reason I mention it is because just last week, I got an SX64 off of that let go for 100 bucks. Somebody had it. He said, oh, well, the latch is broken on the front. Oh, for 100 bucks, an SX64, I don't care. Right? There could have been more wrong with it, I think they got the bucks for it. Um, I had a dialogue with the person. We met in a neutral location. It was great. Very, you know, very good. Uh, the fact that he didn't have to ship it, it was local, that, that was key. If the guy was in Seattle, I would have said forget it. Um, so yeah, we just talked about this. Beware of misrepresentation, uh, hidden damage, right? If they don't take a lot of pictures. When I sell something on eBay, which I rarely do, I take a million, I'm a big fan of disclosure. Take a million pictures, say exactly what's wrong with it. If there's a tiny flaw, I will put a light on it and zoom in and say, look, there's a scratch here. Stuff, I mean, to me, this stuff sells quicker that way. When people feel like they really know what they're getting, they don't mind spending the money and it'll go so quicker. Um, and now shipping, right? So again, I don't want to belabor this, but I sent a Apple II to Germany. Just the system, right? About this big. I got a box about this big, right? Halfway full of peanuts, wrapped the Apple II, took all the cards out of the Apple II, wrapped the cards separately in static uh, bags, right? Added them separately, wrapped the Apple II in about six inches of bubble wrap, floated that in the box, and then filled the box up with peanuts again to the point where I had to really press it to. to uh, close the box. Now what that does is it keeps things from shifting around and the peanuts absorb the shock, right? Any shock. So it rolls off the back of the truck, somebody bounces it, great. I, you know, I could have shipped, um, you know, fine porcelain in there and it would have been fine. Made it to Germany, no problem, right? You just, you just, you just got to use it. Some of these shippers, I don't know what they're thinking. You got you to use your head. Plastics get old, they get very brittle, especially candy stuff. Mm. Oh, and apple stuff. <laughs> What's that? And apple stuff. And apple, well, and apple stuff too. Yeah, it tends to be a little thicker wall. To, but it, it's real still, brittle ABS. And especially monitors, right? Monitors are the worst because they're heavy. Any impact, all the force goes into the case or into the, you know, the cover, and it cracks. And if you have a box for your device, put it in another box. Yes. Yeah. That, that's very important. And do you, the buyer a favor and just protect the, the original box. That's not. Um, peanuts are cheap. As so if, you, if you know where to get it. If you know where to get well, it, yeah. yeah. But I, what I'll do when I, I buy something, I will actually email it before I pay. I will email the person selling and say, please pack it and ship in this manner, and I will gladly pay you anything it costs you to do so. Yeah. Gladly. And if you if you get it in bulk, you can get the uh, expanding foam stuff that they use to ship oh, yeah. too. It's not cheap individually, but if you get a bunch of it, it's not bad. And, and if it's something very valuable, it's worth it. Yeah. Yes. Two things. One, a uh, very similar situation. I was buying a Mercury uh, control switch with a few vials of mercury that actually works on the camera. Oh, uh, ooh. 
Not a problem. Uh, I worked with these many years back in the 70s, so I bought it for the vintage, which was in good shape, and I told the guy how to mobilize mercury. He sent me an email back to Johnny Fleabay, and he said, it's great working with you type, type of guys. You know exactly what's going on. Okay? Back down in half a year without a problem. Number two, I have another pending uh, eBay sale. It's already been purchased. You know, guys already got his money. It's only two hours away. I've been whipping. Got an email, and I said, "Do you mind if I come pick this up?" Could because it's a galvanometer that's in a nice wood case. You can't ship that easily. It's just like you're doing. Everything's going to go crumbling, and once you break the wood, it's it's done. And you just said, "Fine, we'll meet. It's not a big deal. We'll sign up a price. You come up here and pick it up." You know, something with me, big deal, two hours. On the other hand, I had a guy that was a half hour from me on eBay. I saw it, he was close. Great, I'll go pick it up. He didn't want to do it. He insisted on shipping. Huh. So I said, okay, if you insist on shipping it, I don't mind. It's not about the money, it's about it not getting damaged to ship it. Right, right. I told him, I'll give you whatever extra it costs. He was really nice about it. He knew he was being a pain. He, he packed it up really nice, he charged me an extra. So, cool. you know, again, Talk, again, communication, right? Okay. Talk to people, treat each other civilly, good things happen. The worst they can say is no. <laughs> That's it. All right, moving on. Uh, this is going to be the last of this, this, this subject. Uh, retail websites or retail storefronts, there are like video game shops that sometimes will have old computers as well. Again, it will, it, this happens to be a, uh, a crap sheet. I was in a video game store in Chicago and they had a. Um, I can't remember what the computer was there. But it, it was an old kind of obscure computer um, that they were only asking maybe dollars for it. And, and the guy said, you know, it, I don't know if it works. Okay, great, fine, take it. Uh, other times you go into video game shops and they see an old computer and they think jackpot. And they put double when you can get it off of eBay. It's, and it sits there forever and they don't want to budge. Hey, you know, whatever, right? You just kind of walk away and say, see ya. I'll come back in a year when it's still sitting there, maybe it'll lower the price. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't hold, when I see a, a, an old computer in a retail place, I don't hide how I hold The other thing is just, you know, talk, again, we'll keep going back to the human factor. Talk to people, right? It's the most overlooked thing. Talk about your hobby to anyone that'll listen. This is how I've got a lot of my stuff. Right now, I'm working on trying to get a Mac Classic 2 from somebody in my work. She's Japanese, she brought her over from Japan. It's sitting in a box in her house right now, and I'm wheedling her and I'm trying to get, I mean, I'm willing to pay her whatever she wants, because I, I want it really bad, I want it yet. Um, I even offered her, I said, if it's not working, I'll fix it, clean it up. If you decide you don't want to sell it, that's no hard feelings, it's, it's yours. So, but uh, I'm working that one right now. Also, build an information network. Again, you let people know you're looking for this stuff. If you have friends that live in garage sales or live in other states. Um, you know, my brother lives in North Carolina, in the Raleigh area. If I see something on Craigslist down there and it looks like it's a good deal, I'll have him pick it up for me. Right? And he'll tell me sometimes if he sees something. A good indication of whether that works is how many emails you get when something interesting pops up on the net. Oh, so, yeah. There was an eBay auction recently of a guy in Georgia who had an entire. Did, did you guys see this pop up? He, he had a story. Oh, yeah. Right. right. And see, you yeah, saw it also. Oh, of course. Right. I got four mails on that one. Yeah. And I'm like, thank you, everyone. Oh, yeah. It's in Georgia, and he's asking too much money, but thank you. And to also prove how well that works, there's someone on Facebook who's uh, someone notorious, Garrett Myers, right? Okay. This guy gets these incredible lots of stuff, and he does it because he has an information network all over the country. That's how he does it. That's how he does it. And 25 next stations and uh, the UP 11, was it? And somehow yeah. he's got like, just ridiculous marks of disposable income to warehouses. <laughs> 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 I was going to say, you don't want to say those two things to me again. No, it's not. Right. <laughs> okay. um, that's it for acquisition. Now, once you have this stuff, you may want to evaluate it. And I think it's, it's a good idea, even if you're not looking to make money off of it, there's a couple of reasons why you, why you might want to. How do you do valuations? It, it's not easy. Right? You can talk to people, again, if you have a social network, if you have computers, look at sold, not, not for sale eBay listings, but for sold eBay listings. And get a bunch of them, get an average, because some of them can throw off the, the curve, right? You can knock out the outliers. Um, 
look at auction house sales. Sometimes they'll have a record when they sold. Um, and, and you know, specialty magazines around uh, you know vintage computing and, and, and talk talk to dealers, right? Ask them, like, what, you know, what do you think this is worth? What do you think it will sell for? Uh, it's important because depending on the size of your collection, you may want to get insurance. So my collection is not that huge that I have to do anything special with my home insurance to cover my stuff. However, yours might be. You might have a couple of pieces that are extra valuable. You want to make sure that if any individual item that's not over a certain dollar amount, so if God forbid something happens and it gets destroyed, you want to get um, replacement value. Right? If you have an Apple II, if, you know, if it's an early serial number, it might be worth a couple thousand dollars, right? So, or more. You want to make sure that your homeowner's insurance is going to cover it in case of a disaster. Uh, so check, call your insurance company, check the dollar limits on that kind of stuff, if they'll even cover it, right? It really varies. Um, as part of that, you may have to catalog and evaluate the collection. Um, some places, like my insurance company, is just like, whatever, we'll take your word for it. We'll get what's there that's wrecked, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out, okay? Um, I quoted a few different companies. I'm not going to list them because there's so many, and I, I didn't check the reputation of them. But just to get an average, for ten thousand dollars coverage was seventy bucks a year, in case your homeowner's insurance doesn't cover it. Sounds like it's probably worth it. five bucks a month. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it might be worth it. Now, getting out. <laughs> this is the this is the big thing, right? So for me personally, um, all right, I, I haven't. And I gotta admit, I'm probably uh, you know one of the offenders here. Haven't given it a lot of thought. I know that someday I'd like to hand this stuff down to my kids um, if they want to keep it or you know certain pieces. But also, I don't want this stuff to be a burden on my family or my wife, especially. And I especially don't want this stuff to end up in the wrong hands. Right. So some of the ways to surrender this stuff. You can sell it. It might be profitable. It might not be worth your time. It depends on what you have and. And what, how, what you're selling, how you're going to sell it, and how much time you have to do it, right? It's uh, not always a, a, you know, a, a, a big profit maker. Um, donating is a great thing if, you, you know, if you're in a position to do it, because uh, at least you'll know if you donate to a nonprofit um, or a museum or to just a school or to somebody who's going to appreciate it and maintain it. Yes? Another thing, staying here, uh, maker spaces. Is a great donation topic target. Great, yeah, yeah, great, great, great thing to do. Um, or you know, if you know friends in the hobby, give it away to them because it, again, you know it's going to be taken care of. All right. Now, and then once you decide that, make a plan. Right. Talk to your relatives and friends about this stuff. Yes, sir. You're leaving out the uh, consignment room. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> 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 so, it's a great. Well, or, or even, um, you know, like uh, vintage shops or antique stores that do consignment. Uh, I, this, right. this, well, this is not a place, the consignment room here at BCF is not a place to get rich. True. There are, somebody, every so often someone will bring in something that they think is, you know, there'll be a kid that wants to buy a new computer and he thinks his old computer is going to fund it. Right. Uh, yeah. But... Uh, basically, the consignment room is a way to get your old stuff into the hands of people who actually want it. Correct. Yep. Correct. Absolutely correct. And, yeah, and, and look, yeah, they're, they're not going to get rich, but at least they get something back from it that will help them support their hobby, right? which is a good, it's, it's a good reason to, to sell stuff. Um, so again, once you decide how you're going to do it, talk to your family and friends to, you know, to say, look, you would you like this if something happens? Um, or this is what I'd like you to do if something happens. Have a will. Now, you know, look, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not gonna tell you that, you know, what to do, but I've seen a lot of misery caused, not probably for a lot of reasons, by people who pass without a will. Right? You could download from one of these legal sites, boilerplate will, and just sign it, and that's legal in, in pretty much all 50 states. Well, right? At least you have something so your stuff doesn't go into probate. What, what does that accomplish? So what happens is if you die, what they call intestate, without a will, it's not that your loved ones won't get your stuff, it's just that now it's going to take a while. If the state's going to have it in probate, it takes months or even longer 
God forbid somebody comes out of the woodwork and contests your estate. It, it's just, it, it's a nightmare. It just five minutes to print something out and put your name on it just ensures that what's yours will go to the people that you intended to. It, it's, just, it's real simple. That needs to be no right. You, you can't uh, just sign it. You just in, yes. In, well, in New Jersey, I don't know that that's the case. We are not lawyers. We're 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 not lawyers. Then the second line. I you can't can't talk to your relatives, then the will and the don't. Are yeah. the, the will has nothing, is going to do you no good whatsoever. Because you can't, you're not around to tell the people what's valuable. Well, no, but wait, so no, that can be part of your estate plan. But you know, so you're, right. it's going to end up in okay. the don't. But recognize there's two issues about having a will. One is right. that, you know, a lot of us are concerned that our collections go somewhere other than the dump, but also it's for making sure our loved ones have the least amount of stress possible. Correct. Correct. Well, right. They the, want to leave the, the stress company. You take care of the stress by explaining to them what this stuff is and why, you know, and what you want to have happen to it when you're gone. That's a discussion. It's not a will. No, and, correct. However, and, and that and that discussion will guide them into you know, well, are they going to give it away, or are they going to you know, where could they give it away, oh, and and that sort of stuff. Uh, just just having a will is is that's great in a perfect world, but I've been in family disputes right. where Uncle Joe gave that to me. That's my guy, and right. no. It's the next person in line decides where that goes. But if you've got a will, Uncle Joe can give you that. Guy. Absolutely talk to your relatives. Absolutely have a will. We are not lawyers. We do not give a <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. We're going to move on. Yeah. So, really, really, that was it. Um, let me get the screen black to get that up there. But, um, it's just like when we ask about the questions. Yeah, any more questions, statements, horror stories? Uh, so, uh, I started formally collecting after jettisoning my entire BB-11 collection years ago. Um, and the first thing I asked myself is, what are my guidelines? What are the, what are the fence posts? And it really helps a lot. It helps poise off the order instinct. Yeah. Uh, I live in a small house, so my collection is everything I aimed at and hold in my hand. So it's all handles, which are put in the back of the station. Right now. See yeah. Great. So I was going to move the entire collection into crates. <laughs> it's kind of nice. Awesome. Very nice. Um, yeah. yeah, but setting that fence post, it, it really, that 11.30 at night, you're like, mm, let me go check eBay. <laughs> and we've all been there. <laughs> the and, and, and if you have the fence post set, it, it makes your life a lot easier. It, it does. Planning it is so valuable. Yes. Was, there was supposed to be a talk about this now along with what you, how do you dispose of your collection? You Correct. Yeah, that, unfortunately, that, I don't can do it. But what I'm asking is, was alluded to maybe some other things that were discussed here, some other options that people would have? But unfortunately, that I wasn't privy to any of the content that he may have had. He didn't really share it with us. I, I, I would have been glad to have included it. Right. Um, yeah, I didn't really. Is that so important, important with us now getting the mage? Is that yes. um, uh, what do you do again? Yeah. I mean, we see it here all the time, right? You've been on the mailing list. You see. Evan will say, oh, this gentleman is sick or unfortunate, he writes some sad stories, and they have these huge collections, and now they're desperate to do something with them so they don't end up in the dump or in the, in the wrong hands, right? They have recycler. And, and we've got, at the BCF, we've got to the point where the majority of the donations are turned away. Right? And we try to keep these hands, but the reality is, and you'll see tomorrow what's happening, we're organizing and getting things back out. But what starts to happen is if we have, and I'm not making this up, uh, 35 common floppy drives, we're not doing the service to the membership by having them sit in the warehouse. And so us taking in the, the common stuff is keeping it out of your hands. And so we don't take that, if we, if we need it, if we need it for, for display, if it's something rare, absolutely. Um, but we do our best to make sure that what comes to us goes to the hobbyists and doesn't sit in the warehouse. So, which I tell you, because a lot of people have the plan of, oh, I will, you know, when I pass away, we'll give it to BCF. 
and then we end up with, I mean, we got, we got one, 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 I think there were seven one, C-128s, which have all been now sold over the couple still for sale. But that's the thing. We, us keeping C, you know, eight C-128s is not good for us. So please think about us if you have rare things. Please think about us if you want us to help you connect with the people who can, who can take this stuff. But please don't count on just putting in your, in your will, give it to the ECF. You know, it may not happen. Yeah. Yes. How do you search Craigslist sort of globally? I mean, like Craigslist is a local list, right? So like, Craigslist, I mean, the website itself, you can. There are front ends that you can search and out. Right. Or yeah. have a network of snitches. Oh, yes. <laughs> that, 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 that works way better. <laughs> the most valuable thing of all. Yeah. I love when people go on the mailing list and say, "Hey, did everybody see this?" Or on Facebook, "Hey, did everybody see this?" Thank you. Great, right? Well, why don't you tell the story about the Atari, the, the Atari deal that, we, that uh, I got involved with and we found from Washington, because in Washington State told us, and it turned out it was like an hour away from us in New Jersey. So, right, so one of our BCF's friends, who lives now, he used to be from here, now he's in Washington State, um, clued us in, hey, there's a guy on a Craigslist in Washington Township, which happens to be the town I live in, that's getting rid of all this Atari stuff. I jumped in my car. I went over and I called him up. On the way there. Like three of us e emailed because yeah. we wanted one specific thing, so the guy really got signed. I hope so. Because he's yeah. like, oh, there's a lot of people who want my lot. I'm like, no, we want No, it was a huge lot, right? So <laughs> I jumped in the car. Yeah, I didn't even call before I left. I was in the car driving, talking to this gentleman. He was a, he was a doctor, he was retiring. Very nice gentleman. Um, he talked my ear off for hours, but it was well worth it. <laughs> it was great. Went in his garage and just boxes and boxes of stuff. Right, told me all about his hobby. Now, the one thing I, I, I didn't mention, and I'll do this real quick before we run out of time. Um, to me, one of the most valuable parts of collecting this stuff is the products, right? The history of this stuff. This gentleman had some interesting stories about why he collected the stuff and what he did with it, and, and over the years and how he got into it. Um, I was out in San Diego one time for a conference. Of course, what did I do? Because I'm, I had a sickness, I went on Craigslist to see what his mood was around. Somebody was selling an Atari 400 for $25. Awesome. Called an Uber, went over there, got into a conversation. Yeah, this was my brother's. Here comes the story. He, um, he was in, he worked for the government. He did, uh, he, he worked on the voice recognition software for the Apache attack helicopter. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just amazing. And you could tell this thing was owned by an engineer. It was immaculate. It was absolutely immaculate, well taken care of. I wrote all that stuff down about his name, who he was, when he got it. That becomes part of that machine now. To me, that's a very, very valuable piece of that equipment. It's a computer. There was thousands of them in. Uh, you know, where did it come from? What was it used for? That's the real value. Right? That's history. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're about out of uh, time. Any, yep. any more questions? Dean and I are here all weekend. Don't hesitate to come up and ask us questions.